Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Before we begin, I, I want to let you know about a new show from Curious Cast that I think you might really, really enjoy. It's called Russia Rising. Putin's Russia has been accused of using internet trolls and hackers and even assassins to influence the West. This new investigative podcast hopes to unravel this, this giant mystery with the help of those who know best. Russian trolls, hackers, Putin supporters, even a former Russian KGB agent. Join Europe Bureau Chief of Global News, Jeff Semple. He goes on a journey to unravel how Russia has gone from tenuous ally to a potential global threat. You can listen to Russia Rising for free at CuriousCast.ca or wherever you're enjoying the ongoing history of new music. Do it. Trust me, you'll love it. One of my favorite movie lines of all time comes from a 1982 Peter O'Toole film called My Favorite Year. In it, O'Toole plays a movie idol named Alan Swan, who was reduced to appearing on a variety TV show of the 1950s. A junior writer named Benji Stone is put in charge of babysitting Swan. Just keep him out of trouble, his bosses say. Naturally, it doesn't go well, and they have a fight when Swan grows angry when Benji insists on the whole hero worship thing. And then Benji replies like this. Whoever you were in those movies, those silly heroes meant a lot to me. What does it matter if it was an illusion? It worked. So don't tell me this is you life-size. I can't use you life-size. I need Alan Swans as big as I can get them. And that's how a lot of us feel about our heroes. And I include our musical heroes in that number. Music is an escape for us. It's also a fantasy land populated by exotic creatures who do and say things far, far beyond what we could ever dream of doing. But at the same time, we want these creatures to be at least a little accessible so we can make that all-important personal connection. This is a really tricky balance. We want our heroes and heroines to be heroes and heroines, but we also want to know that they're real. Keep the fantasy, but, you know, just open the door a crack. And it's more difficult with some artists than others. For example, how do you handle someone like Florence Welch of Florence and the Machine? Much of her success is based on a kooky, quirky, fantastical image, like someone who looks like they just stepped out of a Renaissance painting or out of a book of Grimm's fairy tales. And then you learn things like, she's not a natural redhead. No, <laughs> That's right, I'm sorry, she's, she's not. She's dark-haired, dyed it as a kid. I think I may have ruined something for some people. Anyway, this uh, is going to be an interesting show. What is with Florence and the Machine? This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Florence and the Machine, featuring Florence Welch, a woman born a brunette. It's a small point and by no means diminishes anything she's done, of course, but it's just one of those little facts that allows us to look behind the curtain a bit, you know? Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and with this program, we're going to take a look at some of the far corners of the career of Florence and the Machine. And by that, I mostly mean Florence Welch. Some uh, deep background, you know? We'll also get into the whole machine thing in, in just a bit. Florence is a fascinating woman, someone who is mentioned in the same breath as Bjork, Tori Amos, Stevie Nicks, and Kate Bush. And what I'd like to do is highlight some of those, let's call them fascinating qualities, so we can all get to know Florence, Leontine, Mary Welch just a little bit better. And to do that, like I said, we're going to meander through her life and her career. So let's get this clear off the top. This woman is not life-sized. I mean, we may want her to be in some cases, but she is not. She is one of those rare creatures that seldom disappoints fans because in many ways she is as eccentric and as wonderfully weird as she appears. And as we go, you will understand why that is. Now, I mentioned earlier that she looks like something in a Renaissance painting. There's a good reason for that. Her mom is an academic from New York and is an actual professor of Renaissance studies. So you can imagine the kind of material that lay around the house as Florence was growing up. Florence's favorite painting was of St. Agatha of Sicily by Piero della Francesca, created around 1450. 
Now, you should know that Agatha was tortured for her faith, and the painting features Agatha with her breasts cut off and sitting on a plate, which she is holding in her hands. Yeah. This would also be the time to mention that Florence had a bipolar grandmother who committed suicide. Florence was 13 at the time. And then there's her father, Nick. He was an old punk who once hung out with Joe Strummer in the days before he joined The Clash. He turned into an ad executive, and one of his biggest accounts was Aero Chocolate Bars. Dude looks a lot like Andy Warhol, which you have to admit is, um, well, let's just call it an interesting look for a dad. There are some more interesting family ties. One grandfather used to hang out with the Warhol crowd at Studio 54. Another grandfather was a deputy editor of the Daily Telegraph. And he was the one who gave Florence her very first favorite record, which, and I don't think this will come as much of a surprise, was the soundtrack to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's just a jump to the left. That young Florence would love this record makes some kind of sense, doesn't it? She developed a major crush on Rocky Horror creator Richard O'Brien when she was just 10. Florence was born in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. She has a sister named Grace, who is four years younger, and then there's little brother JJ. The hair dyeing happened at age 10. Mum's work took the family to New York for a while, where everybody went to school. And this is when Florence was diagnosed with dyspraxia. This is a genetic neurological condition that makes it tough for someone to plan and coordinate their physical movements. There can be issues of balance and posture. Dyspraxics can appear clumsy or somehow not quite in sync with the space around them. And in some cases, dyspraxia can affect social skills and judgment. Treatment requires all kinds of physical and occupational and even speech therapy. So imagine now if you're young Florence Welch. You're growing up in a liberal, academic, creative environment with interesting parents and relatives, which already imbues you with interesting views of the world. You're uprooted from your home in the UK and plopped into America. You're tall for your age and insist on having bright red hair. And then you realize that you have this neurological condition that makes you feel even more different. Self-conscious even. Very self-conscious. And then on top of all this, you are always a dreamer, a pretender. Doesn't it seem natural that a person like Florence would lose herself in the escape that is music? Shake it out from the second Florence in the Machine album, Ceremonials. Little side note. When that album was being recorded at Abbey Road Studios, I was given a tour of the facility. Florence and company were set up in Studio 3 with all kinds of exotic instruments and carpets and candles. And as I was led through the room, I was instructed not to touch anything. But I did. Well, wouldn't you? Anyway, uh, back to young Florence. Music and singing became her thing very early on. And again, we're talking about age 10 or 11. She had such a lovely voice that she became the go-to person for singing at funerals. Again, imagine the impact that might have had on a young child. From there, she went to a very exclusive, very expensive private school where she devoured all sorts of literature, especially Emily Dickinson and Emily Bronte. Oh, and she also developed a thing for anything to do with Jack the Ripper and anything to do with, with murder. The grislier, the better. The school also had massive music and art departments with some very good teachers. And then her parents split. More serious emotional drama. New dad was a neighbor with three kids of his own, and she went from being the eldest to the middle child. And the blended family didn't blend so well. Florence spent more time in her bedroom, reading, listening to music, singing, and dancing. And there is where she found a lot of solace in Billie Holiday. When it came to making her own music, Florence's first band was a punk group called the Toxic Cockroaches. 
It was her on guitar and vocals and her friend Mira on drums. She developed a thing for Daniel Johns of Silverchair and spray-painted his name all over their practice space. Meanwhile, back at school, she was being taught how to sing in the classical style, but she kept annoying her teachers by trying to sing the classics with overtones of a blues singer, going back to those Billy Holiday records. Much teenage partying followed. Nothing really unusual, except that these parties introduced her to David Bowie and Kate Bush and the Talking Heads and Fleetwood Mac and Joy Division. She had a boyfriend who was in a minor touring indie band, and it was about him that she wrote her very first proper song. It was called My Boy Builds Coffins, which would later turn up in her 2009 album, Lungs. Florence Welch's first song, My Boy Builds Coffins. It was inspired by her first real boyfriend, who was actually building a coffin for the cover of an album he was making with his indie band. By the way, the band was called The Ludes, and I don't think they ever turned into anything. But but wait a sec, wait a sec, things will turn out well for him. You'll, You'll see in just a moment. The song was recorded with the help of someone named Isabella Summers. And this is where things take a twist, and it involves an old babysitter, a woman's bathroom, and much too much to drink. Hang on. If we're going to call this program anything, it's what's with Florence Welch in the machine? I'm trying to figure out who Florence Welch is, what the machine does, and how all this music gets made. Now, just a few minutes ago, I mentioned Isabella Summers, or Iza, to everybody who knows her. Years ago, Iza used to babysit Florence's younger sister, Grace, and that's when they first met. Is is six years older than Florence, and she went on to become a DJ, someone who became obsessive about hip-hop. She did quite well, too, and later Florence would run into Issa when she was DJing at various clubs around London. Issa was also grabbed to remix some material for Florence's boyfriend's band, so they met in Issa's tiny studio once in a while. It was during some downtime in that studio that Issa and Florence started messing about with some music together, and later, much later, this would result in their very first collaboration. Here is the original demo. I said to worry your own, it's not gonna hurt out my reputation's got a clouded with dirt. That's why you sleep with one eye open. The name of that demo is Girl with One Eye. It was the first song Florence Welch ever worked on with her soon-to-be partner, Issa Summers. A co-writing credit goes to a guy named Matt Alchin. He's that first boyfriend, the member of the Ludes and the builder of the coffins. A proper version is on the Lungs album, so that boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend, did okay, royalty-wise. In fact, he did even better with another song, but we'll get to that in a sec. We're almost ready to start talking about the and the machine part of Florence and the Machine. But first, back up to before that last song was recorded. Starting around 2004, Florence Welch and her boyfriend, Matt Alchin, played pubs around London, her singing, him banging a drum. That lasted into a big dramatic breakup, after which Florence drifted into a group called Ashok, who recorded a record called Plans for a Tiny Little Label. That album contained a song called Happy Slap. Matt co-wrote that one too, and it would later end up in the Lungs album under the title Kiss with a Fist. The original demo of Kiss with a Fist, the first official Florence and the Machine single when the Lungs album was put together in 2009. But that is not Florence and the Machine. The group is called Ashok. Florence is in the band. She was about 19 at the time. And of course, the song would undergo some serious reworking over the next couple of years. There were issues with Ashok and Florence quit, which brings us back again to Isabella Summers. She and Florence continued to hang out and experiment with recording in Issa's cheap studio. They joked around a lot, even to the point of doing elaborate puppet shows, which they then set to music and then videoed under the name Florable and Miserabella. And truth be told, these puppet videos kind of look like something out of the Team America movie. One such track was called Little Donkey. 
this is weird stuff. And here's the audio from that 2008 film. If you're a Florence and the Machine fan, look that up. It's called Little Donkey and appears online under the name Florable and Miserabella. It's very weird and violent and kind of bloody. But in the context of our story, our attempt to figure out what's with Florence and the Machine, it's very important because with this project, Florence and Issa played with the idea of taking on characters whenever they played. Florable and Miserabella morphed into Florence Robot and Issa Machine, and that ultimately became Florence and the Machine. Florence Welch out front, Isabella Summers working as the music-making and music production machine in the background. The two of them tried to organize their energies. No, wait, scratch that. Issa tried to organize Florence's energies by helping her construct something called the Florence Commandments, which I shall read to you now. These, for a while, were Florence Welch's guiding principles, and they may still well be. Not really sure, but anyway, here, here they are. There are 10 of them. Number one, always carry seeds. Number two, always carry a book. Number three, support your local charity shop. Number four, it has support Diet Coke scratched out, and then listen to Dave and play football added in later. Number five, wander about a lot. Six, never know the exact details. Seven, dance to all the music dance hall style. Eight, appreciate your feet. Nine, be a country singer. And ten, climb anything. Okay, so that's uh, not weird or flaky at all. I'm not sure if that really helps us understand anything, but okay, what, whatever. We are trying to figure out what's with Florence and the Machine. As you can see, we've wandered pretty deep into the weeds. We're definitely well over the border into eccentric land, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's artists like these that make our music extra interesting. We don't want them life-size, remember? We need to go into the women's bathroom for the next bit. By the end of 2006, Florence Welch was regularly flitting about the London club scene. One night, she found herself at a place called the Soho Review Bar, which was a renovated strip club. And after many, many drinks, she spotted a woman named Mayred Nash, who was one half of a scenester duo known as the Queens of Noise. They were always at these parties. They were always hanging out and sometimes DJing, very famous people with, with the scenesters. And Mayred was extra famous in certain circles. A number of indie artists had actually written songs about her. Plus, she and partner Tabitha Denholm had a show on BBC Radio, so pretty influential. At this party, Florence was determined to meet Mayred and to make an impression. But because people were always hanging around Mayred, it was impossible to get her attention. So Florence kind of hung back and waited until Mayred went into the bathroom. And she followed. Once she got Mayred cornered in the loo, she began singing an Edda James song at her with the sole intent of proving that she had a big, strong voice. She, oh, let, let, let's just let her tell the story. And, um, before we do the next song, I just wanted to do something. Um, this song meant so much to me and actually is the whole reason I'm here today. It's because I sang this song in a club toilet to my manager, drunkenly. So this is uh, an Etta James song, and I'm singing this for Etta James tonight, who sadly passed away very recently. So this is for Etta James, who is basically the reason why I'm here in front of you. Sometimes I get a good feeling, yeah. I get a feeling that I never, 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 never had before, no, no. I just want to tell you right now, baby, I believe. Okay, weird, I, believe I know, but it worked. 
Mayward liked her enough to book Florence to sing some covers in an upcoming Christmas party. But at that party, Florence also busted into some original material. And this is when Mayred realized that she was a real talent and said to herself, I have to manage this woman. And soon a deal was struck. And it was Mayred, with all her connections, that got Florence her record deal. And she's still managing Florence today. So let's step back. Drunken girl walks into a bathroom at a bar and auditions unbidden for one of London's biggest scenester people who becomes so smitten with her that she becomes the drunken girl's manager, which has since resulted in worldwide success. Now, if that was written in a novel or a movie script, it would be rejected as being completely implausible, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. The demo of Dog Days Are Over that helped Florence Welch and her machine partner, Issa Summers, get that first record deal. And just to keep with our theme of artsiness and eccentricity, the title of the song was inspired by an art installation in South London called The Dog Days Are Over, which was on Florence's route to art school. We should talk about drums for a moment. A lot of early Florence in the machine shows featured Florence singing and whacking on a drum with Isabella playing something in the background. The best example of this is probably Dog Days. That sense of rhythm has carried through plenty of songs since those days. Florence and Isabella also like interesting and unusual instruments. For example, the band includes Tom Monger, a self-styled jazz and rock harpist. He'd begun with classical harp lessons in college, but when instructors grew tired of him getting all jazzy and rocky with such a serious instrument, he knew it was time to leave. Tom experimented with adding all kinds of effects pedals to his instruments. Uh, he is not your average harpist. Naturally, Florence and Isabella love the dude. And here's a track from the Ceremonials album that features both big drums and harp. It's called No Light, No Light. No light, no light in your bright blue eyes And every good daylight could be so violent A revelation in the light of day You can't choose what stays and what fades away You notice the harp in that song? That's a dude named Tom Monger. In October 2009, there was a disaster when the band's gear was destroyed when their equipment trailer went up in flames during a European tour. The band stood on the side of the road listening to the harp strings ping as they broke. Let's go through a few more things before we call it a day. Florence, like Dolores at Reardon of the Cranberries, is one of those people who likes to perform barefoot. She's always preferred dancing without shoes, so it was only natural for her to kick off her shoes when she's on stage. This has resulted in any number of injuries, including a broken foot that resulted from a stage dive during a gig at Coachella in April 2015. So it's sort of fitting that she subbed in for Dave Grohl at Glastonbury after he broke his leg falling off the stage in Sweden. The drinking was pretty severe for a while. After a night of partying with Kanye West, she woke up at the hotel with a chipped tooth. No idea. Florence had to take a year off between the Ceremonials album and How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful because she had a nervous breakdown of sorts, a case of too much, too fast, plus some relationship issues, a string of breakups, actually, punctuated by too many mornings waking up with a wicked hangover, and that kind of thing can knock anyone down. Now, though, she says she no longer drinks. Probably a wise thing. When grunge came along in the early 1990s, a big part of its appeal was that the performers on the stage and on the records and CDs tried to come across as normal people. They were just like the people in the audience, dressing the same, thinking the same, using the same language, and having the same hopes and dreams and fears and frustrations. And that attitude was really, really important to the success of grunge. But after a while, we decided that we didn't want our rock stars to be like us so much. We wanted them bigger and cooler and larger than life. And when we went to a show, we wanted spectacle and theater and escape. And this is very important, our money's worth. Today, we're currently in a phase where spectacle and relatability pretty much balance each other out. It's cool to see someone on a stripped down stage letting the music do the talking. That's where we find somebody like Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters. But if we also want to keep dreams alive, we need those larger than life personalities. The ones who aren't afraid to be weird and kooky and careless and experimental. And that's where we find Florence and the Machine. We need both types of heroes 
if we're going to stay interested. More on my website at ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Make sure you sign up for the free daily newsletter. And you can email me anytime at alan at alancross.ca. And I'm on the usual social networks. Find me there. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 